February 18, 2014. I'm here with my colleague, Paula Thompson, and we are presenting today, Hyper Research Creates Hyper Happy Doctoral Students. This was a program that was put together um, from a grant we received from the Information Technology Department at Pepperdine. So what we're gonna do is, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the need what prompted the need for um, having this, pr this project, this program. We're going to then transition, and Paul is going to talk about the software itself and do some demonstration of the tools involved with the software. And then um, I'll come back with sharing with you some feedback we've gotten from the, an initial eight students that participated in the program and uh, some of their feedback and recommendations for other doctoral students as well as uh, recommendations for GSEP moving forward. And then we'll be happy to entertain any questions. We have a small group here, but uh, if we have any questions, we will be happy to answer those. Okay, the education division as part of the Graduate School of Education and Psychology we have, as of this term, we have 267 registered doctoral students in dissertation. So to get a sense of how large that is, this is not 267 doctoral students, but 267 in dissertation, which means they've completed their coursework, they've completed comprehensive exams. And um, when we look at our four doctoral programs, the EDLT, which is the EDD in Learning Technologies, 56. The EDOL, the Organizational Leadership, which is our largest program, and you can see that reflected in that there's 151 students in EDOL that are currently in dissertation. Our EDLAP, which is the Leadership Administration and Policy, also referred to as ELAP. We have 46 students in dissertation. And then our fourth doctoral program, Organization Change, we still have a, a 14 individuals remaining in that program. So it's a lot of students doing dissertation work. And we continue to admit about 100 new doctoral students every year. So the expectation that these numbers are, uh, will probably continue to increase. One of our goals has been to do a better job of helping students be more successful and efficient in their process so that they get out of here, they graduate within a four to five year period. And um, so we've been looking very closely the last couple of years about what are some of the issues that are creating the um, lack of progress, if you will, in terms of moving forward. We also are seeing a shift in the type of research that is being done by our students. Uh, if you're listening to this um, podcast, is it a podcast or a tape? Video. 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 Um, EDD is a doctorate in education. <coughs> it's a, an applied program. So it's a scholar practitioner program. And that means that we're focusing our research very much in the organizational settings. That when people choose their idea for dissertation research, they're making that choice, needing to make the argument about how they're going to apply what they're learning. So what that means as we promote that is that we're seeing a shift as well to qualitative inquiry, not just quantitative inquiry. So I want to spend a couple minutes talking about qualitative inquiry because that really is important for understanding why this type of a program and providing these types of resources is important. So just a few key points. Qualitative methods are best when the purpose is to understand an area where little is known. So our programs are focusing toward, uh, for example, in learning technologies, leadership administration, organizational leadership, We've been studying those areas for a long time, but lots is changing very rapidly. So we're going to use qualitative methods. When we want to understand a phenomena deeply, qualitative methods is more appropriate. 
when we are trying to create new theory or arrive at theoretical propositions, qualitative inquiry is more appropriate. We also strongly believe part of our culture here at Pepperdine is we believe in the community of learners. We, we, uh, we um, practice everything we do around collaborative learning. And so that means we also value that the people participating are the ones that know the most. So qualitative methods are best when we're trying to learn from the participants in the setting um, or to process the way they experience it rather than in traditional approaches where the researcher hypothesized what was true and then went and tried to collect data to prove it. Qualitative inquiry is much more inductive. You start with what's out there, you're trying to learn from the people and make me the way, understand the way they make meaning. Qualitative methods are best when we're trying to make sense of complex situations, multi-textual data, changing and sh shifting phenomena. And again, if we think about the organizations, whether they're schools or businesses that all of our students participate in, they're very complex environments. So with qualitative inquiry, there's a lot of myths and misunderstanding about it, um, but the qualitative data comes from many sources. Field notes, the researcher keeps existing documents, very commonly, we do interviews, and so we have interview data. But we also have a lot of audio and videotapes available to us. And many times, we, we're now looking at what's in these news groups and these forums and the uh, asynchronous activities. That's captured text. It's all there. It's qualitative data. And so the analysis process is different from quantitative or statistical analysis. But qualitative analysis does have integrity and can involve a very rigorous process. So what are our students doing? They're doing exploratory designs. Many times they're mixed methods designs, meaning that there's a quantitative component as well as a qualitative component. But in general, they're exploratory rather than explanatory. They're not testing hypotheses. They're answering questions. They're exploring phenomena. And so the, we capture data by talking to people. We also look at the other artifacts in terms of research terms, we refer to them as artifacts, forum posts, website content, narrative data, this audio and visual content. And the goal then in qualitative analysis is to make sense of complexity, to obtain new understandings, to develop new theory, to construct and answer research questions. So when people say there's no analysis in qualitative inquiry, I always try to step in and say, well, there is. The analysis is different. It's not statistical analysis, but it is an analysis process that's rigorous. So why do we need qualitative analysis software? Which gets us to what we were doing in terms of this project. Why we use the analysis software, and this comes from uh, another source, someone in the room mentioned Saldana, who's a wonderful source. I like Richards and Morse's work as well. Talk about data management and storage. The software provides us with a faster and more efficient way to code our data. There's no limit to the coding categories. I don't have to worry when I run out of colors of pencils. <laughs> Those of you that have been around for a while, we used to code data by having different color highlighters. There's much more flexibility. I can copy, I can move, I can sort, I can change. I have an ability to search and query. I have ability to organize. I have the ability through the software to display data, reports and other visuals, and I can have easy access to multiple users. So for example, as a chairperson, I'm able to sit down with my student in their, with their data, in their code book, and say, explain to me how you came up with all of this. <coughs> Excuse me. So why hyper-research, hyper-transcribe, which is what <coughs> I selected for this project? It's cross-platform. So in the education division, we continue to have students that use Macs as well as PC. One of the other very common uh, 
qualitative software programs people talk about it is Vivo. In Vivo it was PC based. They used to have a Mac version, but they abandoned it. And so um, it was very important for me <coughs> to find something that would work for everyone. It supports coding, theming, and theory building. It allows you to import text, audio, video, and other media files. It's highly intuitive. It's user-friendly as an interface. So when sitting at a doctoral committee, Dr. Currington's here with me. We continue to talk about all these doctoral students and all the challenges we're having as faculty in trying to help them move forward. IT grant comes out, and so this was the proposal I put together. And the goal of the project, to increase the knowledge of data analysis processes through the use of qualitative analysis software, to enhance the credibility of our qualitative studies by providing tools and instructions for qualitative analysis. That's an important one. We also wanted to enhance the quality of the work that our graduates were um, coming up with. To support the internal study validity of research involving this capture and analysis. And also to increase our student completion rate by facilitating the analysis phase of the dissertation process. So, it was in December 2012, a year, over a year ago, the grant was awarded in January through March. Um, we were focusing on software selection, designing the workshop. I um, hired Paula Thompson, which I'll have her introduce herself in just mm -hmm. a minute, to help me with this process. Uh, and we sent out invitations to all dissertation students in our doctoral programs. In May, we, we had a response, we confirmed it back, we did our first workshop May 19th, we did a second workshop June 8th, July through September was ongoing coaching and support, and we wrote up an initial report in the fall as requested, and then we just recently um, we're able to do a follow-up mm -hmm. survey because we've had people complete and so we're presenting now and we're going to be updating our final report. So we had a flyer that went out mm -hmm. to the students, had a lot of interest. We used Qualtrics, which is another, uh, it's a survey software tool that Pepperdine provides. So we set up a Qualtrics application. What we asked the doctoral students, what's the abstract of your proposed study? That 50 word required description they have to have to get to prelim. If so if someone said to me, I don't have an abstract, it's like, you're not ready yet. You're not <laughs> ready to move forward. We asked about their methodological approach with the idea to get a sense of how they were planning their research. What were their plans for data collection strategy and the format of their data? their current status in the dissertation process. We asked about their confidence in using software. We're trying to get at the idea of are these, because students in our learning technologies program have a very different level of expertise with using software tools than our org leadership program. And then lastly, as any good faculty member through the years here, I needed to know who their chair was so that I could connect with their chair and make sure that the chair wasn't worried that we were going to be instructing students to do something they didn't like. And then there were two open-ended questions. One was, when thinking about your dissertation, describe your concerns about analyzing the qualitative data. Second, if selected for participation, what do you expect about qualitative data analysis? So we're going to transition now to Paula because the way they responded to that is the data set we're going to use to show you how the software works. And so uh, Paula, if um, mm -hmm. I will change this mm -hmm. if you want to share it. Paula's a graduate of our Organization Change doctoral program and I asked her to give her um, two floor version of the mm -hmm. Her dissertation, what it was about while we're getting that going. So, Paul, we'll take care of that if you want to tell us about your dissertation work. Well, I'm sure I'm not being taken. So. Go ahead. 
Go ahead. Okay. So yeah, my name is Paula Thompson. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, and I'm a graduate of the EDOC program two years ago. And um, I did a mixed method study using um, SurveyMonkey as my data collection tool. And it was on the imaginary conversations that people have in their minds with their real life coworkers. And at the time, I used, yeah, you can laugh. <laughs> at the time, I used um, um, in vivo to do the qualitative analysis part of things. And that was a, an OK program, but I have to say I struggled with it. And there were, you know, like most Pepperdine um, students, I was doing it all on the weekends. And there were some times when I felt like this, take, this is taking longer than if I just had my colored highlighters and such. And so um, since I've, I've graduated, I've also started a business as a, a coach. And I do some academic coaching and dissertation coaching. My background is in faculty professional development. And so when Kay and I started talking about it and we looked at hyper research, I, um, I'm a big fan of it now. And I recommend it to my clients. And I also have some dissertation students that I've recommended it to. And the reason why, as we walk through it, is I really feel that for Students at the dissertation phase, it's often the right size tool for the volume of data that they're working with and the complexity of analysis that they're doing. And so we'll go through that a little bit more in depth. So as Kay said, we'd ask these open-ended questions about their concerns and what they wanted to learn during the workshop. And I used, I created a data set from it, which you're going to see through my slides so that we could um, use their own data as the data set for examples in the face-to-face -face workshop. And also, we used it to guide ourselves in what we were going to teach. So I used um, an inductive approach, reading their responses and sorting them. So here's the codes that went with what their concerns were. They were concerned basically about more about the qualitative analysis part. How do they read and understand the data, make sense of it, accurately apply the coding? And, um, and then they had some concerns about software and process, about it being you know, time consuming and just how to get from, from A to Z. And so what they wanted from being a participant in the program was not only methods assistance, but most of this stuff is about the software itself. Um, how to use it and code and theme and, and make transcripts and reports and such. So our face-to-face -face workshop um, in May was a little bit more didactic and instructive than the second one, which was more coaching oriented. And so during this workshop, we walked through the three main steps of getting from you've collected some data to being able to write your chapter four. And those steps are preparing the data, conducting the actual analysis, and then creating reports of your findings. So as I go through this, I'm going to switch a little bit into screenshots. And um, I know that some of these are a little bit hard to see. This is a screenshot from HyperTranscribe, where what you see here, um, oops, sorry. Is my mouse projecting? Yeah. So what you see here with the, um, the woman in the box, it's actually a video. And this side box is the, the person transcription of the video. So the nice thing about HyperTranscribe is that you can put in mi uh, video files or audio files. And basically what it does is it plays five second intervals at a time. And you type along with the five seconds. And then you press a button if you want to go to the next five seconds, or you press a different button if you want to go back and repeat that five seconds. One of the things that um, we learned a lot about, I think, in this workshop is the importance of preparing your data before you bring it into the software. <laughs> and, and it ended up being something that we coached the students on quite a bit. This is the, ac the actual final text file of um, the students' respondents to the questions, the open-ended questions. And as you can see in this model, what I just did is assign them each a unique number. And then I put everything that they had put into the Qualtrics in by person. Um, and when I go to the screenshot of Hyper Research, you'll see how it brings it in exactly how it is. So the importance of really being thoughtful at the beginning about how you want to see your data in there, because once it's in there, that's how it's going to be. 
and related to this, so the, the hyper research calls a case, it's kind of, you know, obvious, like what is the case, except we went through a whole lot of conversation and then how to organize your source data around what you want the case to be. So these are some actual examples that we went through in the workshop that represent real students situation. So let's say you conducted eight brief interviews, each are like maybe transcribed to one or two pages each. Do you need to import them as eight separate cases or could it be just as easy to combine them into one file that looks something like this and just work on it as one case? Um, another student was working on her point of analysis was the actual conversations from tech, I'm sorry, from chat boxes on a tech help website for a library. And so we went through this kind of question. What is the case, an analysis that you want to break it up by? If you have, and I think she had thousands of, so would you want each of those to be its own source file that you import and each stands alone? Or would you maybe want to subdivide them or group them by a time period, like everyone in the fall sem semester or everyone in the month of September? Or maybe you wanted to group it by the staff member and look at responses that way. So this is kind of like when Kay is saying there are, there are methods and analysis, this is part of the same way that you da do data organization and data cleaning in a quantitative study. There's a lot for the student to think about in advance of conducting the analysis. So here is a screenshot where, um, and you can see if the mouse will work, these one, two, three. Over here is what's called the source. So that text file I showed you a minute ago, here is where it is imported into Hyper Research. And then in, in the middle here is what's called the code book. What's nice about the code book in Hyper Research is if you're doing a study where you have a pre existing code set, say that you're using um, the servant leadership model and there are 10 known components, you can just preload and predefine all of them. And then once you bring your data in, start applying them. Or if you're doing like this kind of a study where you're reading iteratively, you very easily just, as it's shown here, highlight the text and then select or create the code that goes with the text. And this middle column in between the code book and the source is basically making a link between that code and that area of text. And this box over here, which is representing the cases, also, every time you add a code, it adds a new um, item to the list. So it's basically an ever-growing list of every code you've applied in every place. Every instance. Every instance. Every instance of a code absolutely. Every instance of a code application. And what I'll show you in a coming box is how you then search and filter those code applications in ways that will help you with your second or third round of review or an iterator review of the data that's been coded. I get a lot of people saying to me, oh, those qualitative softwares do the coding for you. No. <laughs> but having said that, there are ways that are built into it to help you accomplish what you want to accomplish. Um, so this box here is what's called the auto code feature in hyper research. Um, and what I've done here is I've put in the auto code feature, the phrase software, so that it went and searched through my entire file for every instance of the word software. It wouldn't necessarily have been needed for this small of a study, but I'm thinking about another student who was in the study who's interviewing people who are um, how their company has assigned them to live in another country as part of their job. And she has hundreds and hundreds of pages of transcribed interviews. So let's say she starts to read things and she finds something about um, a participant talking about feeling lonely. So what you could do with autocoding is go in there and put in the words lonely, loneliness, alone, and then run a search and it'll tag every place in every, all 200 pages where any of those words are. And then is where the coding is, then is where the person has to get into it, right? Because you have to sit there and read each instance of it and make your judgment, do I want to apply my lonely code to that point of data or not? So it's helpful to find the needle in the haystack, but there's still a lot of individual judgment to be made. And then filtering here, when you use this box, is where you can um, filter by cases 
and or filter by codes. So once you've coded everything and you want to find all the everything that's been coded software, you just, you know, it'll drop down, you pick the code software, and as it's done here, it's gone through and told us that there are 20, 12 of the 73 codes are for the code software and it's highlighted each instance of it. So that's again, when you're doing your second or third round or you're trying to make some higher level sense of things, it's a really easy way to navigate what you've done. Annotations is um, another feature where it's just a place where to keep your notes. So if you're wondering about something or something was really unique or whatever, and it's just a place where, like with um, you know, old fashioned field notes, they're more for yourself than they are for, um, you know, maybe for the analysis. One thing that, well, I guess we'll find out what the students liked and didn't like. <laughs> but one thing that got some oohs and ahs during our workshop was the frequency report. So this is a very basic little, um, you know, under the tools feature where it, you can select all codes or some subset of codes and it just simply counts them for you. And I've had some people say to me, oh, well, then this is the quantitative part of my, and I'm like, no, <laughs> just because there are numbers on it doesn't make it quantitative. But it is a really nice summary to sort of help you see what codes you've used and not used and, and to maybe help you sort of say, are there real differences between the codes that I've created? Could some be combined? You can make groups of codes and things like that, and sometimes running a, a frequency will help you find that stuff. And then word cloud is a similar kind of feature, except the difference is the frequency report reports for codes and word cloud literally just counts words. And so that's why, um, as in this example, these are the 80 most common words in this data set. And the word data is the most commonly used. And then words like how and qualitative and learn are in there. And that makes sense based on the questions that we were asking. I just think they're a fun little thing to put in your chapter four, if you ask me. I haven't attempted to do that. One thing that you can see here is the slider bar. So it does allow you to sort of say, the top 10 words or 80 words or 120 words or whatever. But I don't know whether I've seen something where it can sort of live on its own. So is your thought, if you then click Look on it, we'll take data, it then it would pull up all of those. But keep, uh, keep in mind, these aren't codes. These are just words. I know, but, now, but for, they hit the column. Mm -hmm. so that's true. They but iterated over them. But mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. what you're telling Matt, that's, can you go back to screen or get rid of the word cloud one more back? To kind of what you're talking about, if you have a theme, if I filter, then it, it yeah, there. pulls up for me all the places that it's in. It filters the data so that I'm only seeing the passages that were coded with software. Right, right. Yeah. So if there are words in a word cloud, then potentially you could go in and search for we could. Codes that right. Codes. We'll send a note to Hyper Research. Maybe that's a yeah, feature, it could just be, yeah, or just add. something I haven't uncovered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a couple final things. Um, for more advanced students, they have a report builder and a theory builder. And so this just allows it some more complex searching. So you might want to say, let's say you have 30 people and you've put imported them as 30 cases. And so you would say, search all cases where I've coded this code and that code and the other code and it will find those for you and help you maybe like bring it up to that higher level of meaning making than being in that forest of the individual codes. And what, what they mean about the theory building is for example you talked about long way. Mm -hmm. So if another theme was length, uh, length of time in the foreign environment you could ask the program to give you every instance where lonely mm -hmm. there's a code for length of time within X number of words. So it allows you to start linking variables together and start 
look, and that's why they call it a theory builder, mm -hmm. that it starts to build the idea of relationships among those codes. And it is a way then that people can use it to create the categories and the themes mm -hmm. that what we try to do with our students is they're coding the data. What do people say? That's the topical coding. But as, as we advance that to more mm -hmm. analytical and thematic coding, that's where they have to start looking at when the code is said for this or that. And that's what mm -hmm. I don't like about that. Frequency report because that's where oh people just want to end there. And say, <laughs> right. This percent said this, this percent said that, and what we're trying to encourage students is to take it to that level of thematic coding mm -hmm. so they're making some interpretation. If all they want to do is count, then they should have just done survey research and not put everybody mm -hmm. through the trouble mm -hmm. of collecting qualitative data. Yeah, and that's another place where this annotations field can be useful if you're starting to just have a sense of something like that as you're reading. It seems like the people are lonely at the beginning, but then they get over it, you know, and you can note that there and then go back and run that kind of report to see if that is holding true or, or what is actually holding true. Uh, just a couple closing thoughts. When we got back together with the students um, in the June session, um, it was a more of a coaching session. And they had been hopefully working on their own data sets in between, although some of them who were not ready were working on some sample data just to get familiar with the program. Um, and so we spent a lot of time helping them, say, like create their codes and code books or doing a lot of what um, we were saying earlier about preparing their data. Um, so that they could import it in a way that they were going to be able to do what they wanted to do. And, and a lot of what Kay just talked about earlier, just more sort of understanding the thematic analysis and how this was going to build into a chapter four for them. Um, and then I still get the question all the time about do I, is it worth my time to transcribe it myself or should I send it out? And um, well, I'll just let that debate hang open for yeah, another I'm workshop. Give us some yeah. Well, we'll have some results oh, yeah? about that because okay. we got some student contacts. So to summarize, again, the the purpose of having the the workshops um, were that it wasn't just about teaching people how to use software because if that was the case, they could have gone to the website. But it was about we wanted to enhance the quality of the dissertation research. And so we wanted to bring that theoretical component in and make sure that people understood qualitative analysis, not just how to use the software. And so um, we did do a follow-up phase. And we, we've had, we, we bought uh, 12 licenses. And um, one of them, I, you know, I have to, to support. So we've always had nine or 10 students using the licenses. And um, we've had eight people that have um, pretty much turned back the license. In other words, they're done. And so I put out 
a request just a week or so ago, a survey, and seven, seven of those eight people replied. So these are individuals that used hyper research and hyper transcribed, and they've either completed or they're going to final defense. One of the questions was, when you made the decision to um, do qualitative inquiry, we gave them a list, ease of use, free access, hyper research, frequency asked questions, there's on the website, YouTube videos on the website, resources that I had put up in a Sakai site, we created a Sakai site that's still there. The fact that we were providing faculty support through the workshops and these face-to-face. -face. So we asked, when you're thinking about all of this, rate the importance of these items. And it was just a very simple three-point scale where one was not very important, two was somewhat important, and three was very important. I want to point out to you which of these <laughs> was the most important in their decision? It was the free access. And I think that's a really important point for the cost of education we have here. So the fact that they could get free access to this $300 software tool made a difference for them. That was the most important, followed by ease of use, if you look at the top, and then the face-to-face -face workshops, the YouTube videos, and the resources are less, all important. Remember, two was somewhat important, but it was very interesting that this, and this I think is important for Alan to know in terms of the IT grant, if we hadn't had this, if I had just offered workshops, but we didn't have the ability to offer the licenses to students, I don't think we would have had the same uh, uh, participation. That's a really good deal. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we asked, the other, the other question, uh, rating question was, of these things, word clouds, faculty support, supported reliability, code book, query process, made a positive contribution to my dissertation process, contributed to an efficient process, easy data management, strength and quality, asked them to choose any and all that applied to them in terms of their own dissertation process. You can see six out of seven said it strengthened the quality of my work. Six out of seven said easy data management. Six out of seven efficiency. Six out of seven positive contribution. Which is really the goal I wanted rather than saying, well, you know, it's the word clouds or the support or the code book. This, I think, really was part of the goal is let's provide a tool that can strengthen the quality of the work, help our students get out of here quicker, the efficiency issue, and manage their data. And you can see the query process, five out of seven, so these are frequencies. Five out of seven said the query process was really valuable. The code book, three out of seven, the fact that it supported their reliability efforts, three. Faculty support was just two. So the fact that I offered my time, Paula offered her time, <laughs> that wasn't what was the most important, which I think is really great. It's really great. Word clouds didn't show, and I think part of that was because we didn't play with them enough. We didn't demonstrate that. Now in addition to this, we gave, had some open-ended questions, and I want to share these comments with you. So one of the questions was, discuss your experience using hyper-research, and these are direct quotes very user friendly and allowed me to start coding immediately after transcribing my interviews, made it easy to support the recoding mm -hmm. that occurred throughout the process, which we of course know that is what contributes to the intra rater reliability that you're constantly recoding. The query feature allowed me to quickly search for codes or combinations of codes across cases. I found it much easier than the other software <laughs> that I had used this person was referring to in vivo. The in-person sessions were invaluable, as was the hyper-research telephone support. So they mm -hmm. did take advantage of the tools that the publisher of hyper-research. This was the perfect software for the kind of research analysis that I was doing. 
versus, again, some of the other products out there are great tools, but they, they don't match in scope what our students are doing. Easy to use, made reporting and tracking easier. Software enabled me to organize my data. It was very helpful due to the large amount of data. Having knowledgeable Pepperdine staff to answer questions was important, so Paula, that was good for <laughs> us. Yay. Yay. I loved it. I was worried about doing qualitative research because of the ambiguity. I like numbers, but having hyper-research made the process very logical, manageable, and enjoyable which those of you in the room that work with dissertation students know that they fear, they dread qualitative analysis. Mm -hmm. So to have somebody say it became enjoyable. <laughs> Hyper research helped to organize my data and my thoughts about the data. Although I could draw some conclusions and themes from reading through the raw data, having an organized system aided in my thought process. So that metacognitive mm -hmm. learning that we strive for. Now, hypertranscribe, just to clarify, hypertranscribe is <laughs> a separate software tool. It is solely for the purpose of transcribing data. And so not all the students used it. Some, stu some students didn't need to because they were using captured text online. So they didn't have anything to transcribe. If they were doing online interview process, it's already transcribed. Hypertranscribe is a great little tool, um, and this I thought was interesting. She says, I, although initially I thought this would be more automatic, <laughs> it still proved to make transcribing much easier. People say, why not use Dragon and let it do it? You could do that, but those of us know that Dragon isn't as efficient and you will spend as much time going back editing and correcting. Mm -hmm. And the value of doing the transcription yourself allows you to easily create your transcripts. She says, I know there are just transcription services out there, but I'm so glad I took the time to listen to the audio and write my own transcripts. I knew those interviews inside and out when I started coding, and it made all the difference in being connected to my research. So it, it starts that process of the first phase. Now, where I find with my students, if they know how to type, it's easy to use. Other people that never learned how to type, if they hire then a transcription service, then we have the issue of having to put the steps in to make sure there's accuracy in that transcription. So it just creates a different set. So some of our students used the hypertranscribe and some did not. Then two last points here. We asked the students, what recommendations would you make for other doctoral students? And this is what they said. Begin transcribing your data as soon as possible. So you do that pilot interview, you start. Transcription allowed me to reflect on the data while it was still, refresh, still fresh in my memory, to jot down key ideas or themes that arise during transcription. It will make it easier to create your code book when you are ready to actually go there and do the, the coding. Remember we said there's this three-step process. You have to prepare the data, then you have to code the data, and then you output the data into results. Another student, be organized. <laughs> Think about your audience and what they might want to know or would be interested to find out. Be thorough, get help whenever you get stuck, which um, dissertation students we know get stuck mm -hmm. so it's really this whole idea of being sure that we let them know it's okay to ask us questions the software makes the process easier when the researcher defines the codes as he or she analyzes the data by doing so the researcher can keep the codes organized learn the tool early again these are recommendations these students are giving other doctoral students it will help you with your coding process if you learn the tool then the last question was, what would you recommend to GSEP administration? I've been very happy with my support, a positive yet firm hand to keep us on track and motivated. This process can be discouraging, talking about the dissertation process, and we need regular visits to stay <laughs> motivated. Another recommendation for administration to continue to leverage these sorts of tools and to continue to help students understand the value 
to, of the tools to the dissertation process would be helpful. And this is something I'm now incorporating and encouraging other faculty to do. Helpful to incorporate this into our instruction. We've done it for years with quantitative, but we hadn't been doing it in the qualitative classes, partly because the software has been expensive. So definitely now, you know, it's part of my course. You can go online, another thing with Hyper Research, download a free version, gives you enough use for a class project. Although we have taken qualitative and quant classes as part of the program, it was nice to have additional support later via the Sakai Dissertation Success site, which came as a product out of the doctoral committee and also this qualitative analysis project. So it was nice to get that confirmation about the dissertation success site. I found the workshops valuable, really enjoyed the face-to-face -face time, and hear how other doctoral students were using the software. I hope this workshop can continue. Mm -hmm. So our next steps at this point, the software continues. I think we have all licenses checked out at the moment. We'll continue to do follow-up. And the Sakai site is there, and so we're going to continue to try to encourage this. So that was our project. Thank you. Linda. One comment, one question, and you just answered what would have been a second question, and that was for all the years that we've been requiring this in our quantitative courses, I'd love to see this scaled such that we could do it in our qualitative, mm -hmm. and so that they are learning the tool mm -hmm. and experiencing it before they get to the dissertation, because at that time, sometimes time becomes a crunch. And right. yeah. if they have to choose, you know, do I have time to learn this, yeah. access it, yeah. and then I'm also trying to, yeah. you know, to make a deadline that yeah. might discourage them. And my question is, with those students, I wondered if any of them, of the eight or whomever, uh -huh. did, did, how did you handle them, in this case, did you, did they allow for the other experienced coders to have access to? So how we did that, that is that um, because the when they were sharing their coded data and sharing the code book to establish <coughs> some reliability, they didn't have to be in hyper research. They can export all of that data into Word documents. So there's not the need. If I had a student give me that excuse why mm -hmm. she didn't go through a process of reliability, she says, well, I, I thought I couldn't share the transcripts and the no, no, no. So anyway, um, you can export the data into spreadsheets, into Word documents, <coughs> and also as a faculty member, if you don't have a license for it, you could download it and you can use it for free. It's a full version, it just limits you up to 50 codes. But that would give you a way that you could look at your student's actual files. Mm -hmm. um, my approach on that is I don't have other people just code all the data. I think that's an old approach to right. qualitative analysis. Because the reality is it's so interpretive. Yes. If somebody else does yes. it, they're gonna do something different. So then right. having a contest to see two out of three, so what I do is have them sit down with a colleague that has experience, knowledge, expertise. They have to explain their code book. Exactly. And then they have to show how they coded the data and have that person really push back and say, gee, you, you coded this one this way, but not this one, and do that several times. And so that's the inter-rater reliability process I recommend. And I just also wanted to compliment you because one of my students that I was hearing participated in the workshops and had, you know, everything positive to say and I saw some of those comments. Thank you. Um, Representative there, I think now I'm working on a chapter five, so I'm excited. Yay. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Well, we had a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, Dr. Hamilton. Okay, well, I think based on your uh, comments on leadership, we, we've adopted hyper research in our SF campus. And, uh, mm, great. Uh, we have two licenses. Uh -huh. Actually, we also had someone who, um, uh, a colleague of mine did a comparison between in vivo and uh, actually doing the comparison. He was going to help us merge the data into in vivo, and mm -hmm. he came back in a while later and said, yeah, we just use hyper research. In, in any case, that 
that coupled with the work you were doing last year led us to hypo research with a couple of licenses. Um, our, our issue right now is on, on coding what we have. Mm -hmm. um, One of the yeah. things I like about um, Hyper Research also, and we didn't go into it today, is on their website, they have um, a large PDF document that you can download that walks you through step by step how to do everything. There's eight different YouTube type video tutorials that they've recorded that are um, that have the audio and also the sort of step by step of drop down and how to do different things. And they have two different um, files, data files that you can use to play around with it so if you're just playing around. So yeah. to prepare them for the activity, yeah. the, the preparation could be they do those YouTube videos yeah. and that thing. Yeah, our, our, we have a, a bank of, of GAs and they've, they've been going through some of that. Yeah. You know, Sandra Simon Paul uh -huh. and uh, yeah. Victoria Sayer. Yeah. Yeah. They've done tutorials based on those. Yeah. Mm. It's like a power drill when you just need a screwdriver. Like, do you really want to make a big hole in the wall? Yeah. 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 And I wonder, too, it could be interesting to find out, Kay, in a few months, now that the students um, who are getting licenses who didn't go to the workshop, if the findings are similar. Yeah. And so that we could maybe really get to the bottom of, we had a little bit of mixed data, right, about That's how right. helpful how the face-to-face -face and coaching was. 
I, of course, think it was more helpful maybe than some of the quantitative data showed, but, but it could be interesting to find out from those who yeah. didn't have it whether they felt as good about the product and the process as the ones who did. So what happens now, because the workshops were last spring, when a student sends an email and says they're interested, we enroll them into the Sakai site where there's tutorials mm -hmm. and instructions, and then when a license, depending on where they are when a license becomes available, then they get the license. But it's mm -hmm. pretty much They just self-teach, self yeah. yeah. So well, that was my next question, mm -hmm. that this was a, obviously, I can spend it in terms of your time, and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. wasn't, not in my time, no not your time, no time. time. Her time. But there's no, mm -hmm. faculty stand at there's no additional, there won't be any workshops that's for our own course. Yeah, it'll just be individuals taking initiative to access the YouTube. Is it, would there be a benefit to extending and having? I don't know about that because I think it's like just in time learning. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I think the resources to support faculty who are teaching the qualitative inquiry classes mm -hmm. or faculty that want to develop more skills in qualitative analysis. But um, I don't know. You know, it'd be I think the just in time is important, and I don't yeah. know if there's other times when your dissertation students come for like a refresher weekend or help weekend that it could maybe be embedded with yeah. that. Right, or you, you might ask Gina, you know, the yeah. 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 writing center, and one of the points, and I didn't put it up here, was one of the students pointed out how helpful the dissertation seminars that Gina's offering mm -hmm. in terms of writing, and students are mm -hmm. participating in those. They are visiting the success site, so maybe if we did schedule some webinars mm -hmm. on how to use hyper research, I, we probably would get would get participation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming and being supportive yeah. of us. Thank you. Thank you. And we are right on time. <laughs> this concludes our video.